Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. A single call to a private investigator revealed that. Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy the show. June 4, 2004. A sign above a three-story building, two blocks north of the courthouse and two blocks east of the police station, read Bailey, Martin and Wills in large gold letters. A joke I heard from people who worked for Lancaster Oil was that the letters were rumored to be made of real gold. Bailey, Martin and Wills, PA, is one of the oldest, most successful, and by far the most profitable law firms in Jacksonville, and much of that money was earned by representing Lancaster and his oil company for nearly 30 years. Moreover, Moore Bailey was Lancaster's personal friend before his death, as well as Dar's godfather. So, I had no illusions about where I was going. I received several emails and one very kind call from a very pretty female employee, inviting me to discuss Dar's situation with members of the firm in a casual and relaxed atmosphere. I had no doubt that they were probably planning to tear me away from my manhood in a casual and relaxed manner, and assumed that I would be like a sheep going to the slaughter of a pack of hungry wolves. Before getting out of my 2003 Jeep Liberty, I made a series of quick phone calls, then ended the last one and exited the car, making sure to lock it. This part of Jacksonville was lower town, with more lawyers and law firms per square mile than should be allowed by law. It was a miracle that the smell of sulfur did not hang over the entire area. While it was usually teeming with cops and an army of sensitive lawyers, this part of Jacksonville was also teeming with pill addicts, dealers, and people who would take your life for a $100 bill. So, it was never a good idea to go out late at night unless you were the first type and you never left your car unlocked. I walked through the front door and took a deep breath. It was the smell of money and law books mixed together. A redhead in a dark red dress, entering the room, looked up at me and smiled. Good afternoon, sir. Can I help you? I couldn't help but smile back, even though she was one of the enemies. I'm sure you could help, but I actually came to see Mr. Bailey or one of his staff. I'm Michael McCarthy. Her smile only flickered for a moment, and then she said, Oh, of course, Mr. McCarthy. They are waiting for you in the conference room on the third floor. She motioned to someone to my left, and a shadow materialized, revealing itself to be a monolith, four inches taller than my six feet two inches. He was well dressed, but the bulge of the large caliber weapon in the shoulder holster on his right side, his close cropped hair, and that cold gaze told me that he was not a lawyer. I'd seen people like him in rough areas all over the world, but I didn't expect to find him here in Jacksonville. If you don't mind, he said, motioning for me to raise my hands. What if I object? That would be a great pity, sir. My job is to keep the building safe, and I'm afraid I can't take you upstairs until I've checked you for weapons. Seriously? Seriously. You may not have been keeping up with the news, but there have been several incidents around the city where an angry client has shot or attempted to harm attorneys or their staff. One lawyer was shot and killed in the courthouse. Mr. Bailey and his staff often deal with issues that evoke extreme emotions. That's why no one goes upstairs without being tested. I raised my hands and allowed him to search me. He pulled out several items, but after examining them, returned them to me. Turn around, he said, and he did the same. Follow me, sir. I followed him to the elevator doors, whose brass had to be polished to a shine every night. About ten seconds after he pressed the button, the doors opened, and I followed him into the elevator. The ride took another ten seconds, and then I followed him into a corridor lined with pastoral scenery. Walking down the hallway alone was enough to conjure up dreams of running through fields of wildflowers in the summer sun. I doubt any disgruntled customer could have retained their rage at the end of this long journey. My guide stopped and pointed to another door. I opened it and entered, and he stopped. It was a long room, and in the center was a long oval table with seating for 26 people, 12 on each side and seats at either end. The table was made of polished wood, so shiny that I wanted to squint at the reflection of the overhead light. The table wasn't the reason I stopped abruptly. Fifteen places were taken. I noticed Bailey sitting at one end of the table, with Billy Wilkes sitting at his right hand. Deerer was to his left. She looked down at the table, and twelve more places were taken. If this is what Bailey and Wills considered an informal and relaxed meeting, 
God only knows what they could arrange for a formal meeting. Bailey pointed to a seat at the opposite end of the table from him. I pushed it aside and sat down. I think that's how General Custer must have felt at that little meeting at the Little Big Horn. Bailey didn't smile. I appreciate your efforts to defuse tensions, Mr. McCarthy, but this is a serious situation and a serious meeting. I hope that our meeting outside the official venue would help us talk frankly and realistically about how we can resolve this dilemma to the satisfaction of all parties, where no one takes notes and nothing goes on record, behind the scenes, so to speak. He looked at Deerer, and it was as if a silent signal had passed between them. She met his gaze and then looked up at me. She tried to make it look like a stranger, but I saw something behind it, or maybe I just thought I saw it. She lowered her eyes again. That's right, Mr. McCarthy. Being able to speak honestly has helped resolve a lot of difficult issues. Well, I'm here. Let's talk. Before we begin, Mr. Harper Stevens informed us about several devices that you carry with you. One of them turned out to be a digital voice recorder, and the other is a mobile phone, which can also be used as a recording device. To ensure that we can speak frankly, I would ask you to hand them over to one of our secretaries for the duration of this meeting. They're not set up to record, and you can see it. I didn't know we would be discussing anything illegal or inappropriate here today. My devices stay with me, or I'm leaving. Your choice. Your attitude is not what we expected, but as you said, we will not discuss anything illegal here today. In any case, I appreciate your desire to get straight to the point. Let's do this. Do you know that your wife wants to end the marriage? I took a deep breath. I know she's let me know a few times that she's unhappy, but that's a far cry from wanting a divorce. She looked me straight in the eyes for a moment and then looked down again. Bailey reached out to take her hand. She told you she wanted a divorce two months ago. She told you again that she wants a divorce a month ago. She said a week ago that she wants a divorce. I'm not sure how much clearer she could have been. When she looked up again, I was looking into those eyes that once loved me. Somewhere inside me, there was a fantasy that she still loved me, but I couldn't prove that what she denied was true. Her beautiful face still bore the bruises from the car accident that nearly killed her and destroyed our marriage. Deerer's voice trembled but was full of iron in her conviction. No, Michael. Whether you believe it or not, I didn't fall in love with you. I didn't marry you. I didn't live two wonderful years as your wife. You know it was like that. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's a fact. No, she said, her voice breaking for a moment. I know what you say, and I know what other people say. I saw photos of our wedding, but all this means nothing. I haven't met you. I didn't fall in love with you. I haven't lived with you for two years. For me, this has never happened. This is not reality for me. Amnesia does not cancel reality. It does not invalidate the marriage. She cancels love, she said. I don't know you. I never fell in love with you. When you touch me, it's like a stranger is touching me. How can you expect me to want you this way when we've never touched, never kissed? It's like a nightmare that I can't wake up from. I just want all of this to go away so I can get back to my real life. It seems pretty obvious. Mr. McCarthy, that whether or not you were married before, you are not married now, said the other senior partner, Wills, his voice dripping with mint julep. You can take the boy away from the bluegrass, but you can't take the bluegrass out of the boy. Even after decades of absence, you may be legally married, but in reality, there is no marriage. I thought lawyers believed in the law, I said. Bailey shook his head with something that almost resembled a smile, but not really. Lawyers don't believe in the law, Mr. McCarthy. We believe in our clients. The law is simply a tool we use to protect the interests of our clients. It seems to me that if you had your client's best interests at heart, you would suggest that she agree to my proposal to see a marriage counselor while she works with the best psychiatrists and doctors we can find to try to restore her memories. That's your idea of Miss Lancaster's interests? I asked. Bailey said. She believes that her best interests are to end this unmarried marriage and return to her old life. He clasped his fingers together and stared at me across the long expanse of polished wood. 
In essence, Mr. McCarthy, this meeting is essentially a gesture of respect for your position. Frankly, I understand how you feel, and if I were you and about to lose my wife, who appears to be the woman I married but turns out to be a different person, I would fight just as hard to keep her. But the hard truth is that you really don't have any say in this matter. Florida is a no-fault divorce state. If Miss Lancaster wants a divorce, she'll get it. You can fight, but you will lose. I will still fight. Why? Because I love her. Because she is my wife. Because amnesia is a tricky thing, and she might get her memories back after she's married to another man, and it would be pure hell. Because I don't like to lose. Call me a pedant, but I like to preserve what is mine. Because even though you talk about Florida being a no-fault divorce state, it only works that way if you give in and let it happen. If I struggle, if I put up obstacles, I can delay it. And the longer I delay it, the more likely it is that her memories will return. Bailey handed the folder to the silver-haired lawyer sitting on his left, next to Deerer. He brought it to me. This is the report of Dr. Herbert Mayfair, the psychiatrist who examined Deerer after the accident and has treated her since. I don't know if you had the opportunity to look at Dr. Mayfair's report, but I've taken a look. Watch it again, please, satisfy the old man. Dr. Mayfair is a respected psychiatrist who has been practicing for 15 years in Jacksonville. Read his findings. I already did that. But I opened the folder and looked through the pages. Towards the end, he wrote, My research, as well as medical evidence from the time of the accident to the present, leads me to conclude with close to 100% certainty that Miss Lancaster suffered severe traumatic brain injury, which in itself would explain her amnesia spanning the past three years following a car accident on March 17th. She was taken to St. Vincent's Hospital with cerebral edema following trauma caused by her car hitting the windshield. This swelling, brain hemorrhage, and trauma could easily have caused enough damage to destroy parts of her memory. Although there is no evidence of ongoing brain damage or any lasting damage to the brain, the injury itself could easily have caused amnesia that would have remained long after any physical damage had subsided. There is also the possibility that any physical damage would have been exacerbated by psychological factors. Based on Miss Lancaster's surviving memories and the testimonies of people close to her, she did not have a relationship with Mr. McCarthy until the last three years and resisted the idea of marrying him. But, in fact, she was forced to do so by her father. If this information is correct, then it is possible that she simply does not want to remember the years of her forced marriage. In conclusion, my professional opinion is that further attempts to recapture lost memories would not only be unlikely, but moreover, they would work against her overall best interests in continuing mental health. As you can see, Bailey said, it is unlikely that your wife's memories will ever be restored, or at least, should be restored. Any professional will tell you that amnesia is still a very nebulous area. Are you willing to risk your wife's happiness for a hope that Dr. Mayfair considers extremely unlikely? I could argue about the obvious false references to Dee's unhappiness during our marriage. She could be pretending, but I didn't think she was. But I wanted to continue this meeting. I took my phone and pressed button number one. While everyone at the table was looking at me, I said to the person on the other end, It's time. Get up. Bailey started to say, what's going on, McCarthy, before I interrupted him. You didn't say I had to come alone to meet your legal army. I have someone I want here, I said. Bailey watched for a moment and then said to his personal guard, go down and meet whoever it is. You can send him up, but it will be a waste of time. Nobody will believe that he's a crazy man with a gun, and if your goon lays a hand on him, you'll have to face a big civil suit. Bailey picked up his desk phone and dialed a number, then listened. After a moment, he winced and said, send him upstairs. Bailey looked at the guard and said, it's okay, Steve. Go downstairs and return to your duties. Half a minute after Harper Stevens left, a tall, angular man with dark hair, cut almost into a crew cut, entered the room. Combined with his hawk-like nose, piercing eyes, and straight-as-a-stick posture, he could have posed for a poster of a German World War I flying ace. The only thing missing was a monocle and a cigarette casually held in his mouth with a cigarette holder. His eyes seemed to evaluate everything around him. Even if I didn't know he was a psychiatrist, 
I would have known. Some cops are still cops in uniform or out of uniform, and some doctors don't need a white coat and a stethoscope. He was one of those guys. He sat down next to me. Dr. Teller, Mr. Bailey said, nodding to him. May I ask what you are doing here today, Dr. Teller? I asked. Bailey replied, this is not a hearing, nothing official. This is simply a conversation between Mr. McCarthy and some of our staff about his marital situation with Miss Lancaster. Teller nodded at me and then looked back at Bailey. I'm not entirely sure why you needed half your legal staff for a simple conversation, but in any case, Mr. McCarthy decided that he wanted me here if there were any questions about Mrs. McCarthy's mental state. By the way, I don't quite understand why you call her Miss Lancaster at this time. She is still legally married to Mr. McCarthy. It's a matter of a woman's choice, Dr. Teller, as you probably know, Bailey replied. In her mind, Miss Lancaster is practically single again. The steps towards this are just a formality. We welcome your input, Bailey continued. But I know you've read Dr. Mayfair's report on Miss Lancaster's condition. You are a respected professional in your field, as is Dr. Mayfair. Regardless of your opinion, we have enough evidence from Mayfair and other related testimony for us to believe that the judge will rule that Miss Lancaster cannot be held against her will in a marriage that simply does not exist in her mind. Teller rubbed his chin as if he were solving some deep mystery. You are, of course, aware of my report from my conversation with Mrs. McCarthy, and you are also aware of my conclusion that there is no evidence to suggest that there was any ongoing brain damage or trauma that would contribute to any kind of amnesia. Amnesia is such a general concept that it can be applied to so many types of memory impairment that it really doesn't have any meaning unless you can be more specific. While my investigation of her medical records from the hospital and MRI and CT scans showed some initial brain swelling, something to be expected in such a severe accident, there is nothing to indicate a degree of severity that would cause such memory loss, especially limited to a certain period of time. There is also nothing to indicate ongoing brain swelling or other stressors. He picked up the Mayfair report in front of me and opened it, flipping through the pages. With regard to Dr. Mayfair's conclusion that there may be psychological reasons for amnesia, this is one of those diagnoses that is easy to make and almost impossible to rule out. Excellent for supporting a diagnosis of amnesia when there is no other tangible evidence. That's your opinion, Dr. Will said. And although you are a respected psychiatrist, I'm sure you know that opinions are like everyone has them. Everyone has the right to their opinion. Leaning toward me, Teller said quietly, there's a reason why the phrase let's kill all the lawyers first is so popular. Wills loves to shake up opposition witnesses, and he can afford to do a lot more today than he normally could. Looking at Wills, Teller said, you're right, of course. An opinion is an opinion, not a fact. I can only say that after interviewing hundreds of suspects in cases ranging from murder to exploitation to cannibalism, I have come to the firm conclusion that Mrs. McCarthy is not telling the truth. He looked at Deerer until she looked up at him. She usually had the poise and control of a princess and heir to a kingdom, but I saw something in her eyes that I rarely saw, fear, or at least uncertainty. Normally, I would leave it at that. Any further comment would, in most cases, be inappropriate. But since this appears to be a very informal meeting to clarify our differences, and you have no difficulty in bringing asses into this discussion, I would feel guilty if I did not tell you, Mrs. McCarthy, that I firmly believe you are lying. Claiming that you suffer from amnesia and an inability to remember your husband, you're pretending. He said, before Wills could respond, while it may be impossible to reach a 100% reliable conclusion about the veracity of her words, there is a method that will at least give a strong indication of their truth. No, Bailey reached out and grabbed Deerer's hand. She blurted it out so quickly that there was no doubt about what she was talking about. Miss Lancaster has every right to refuse any kind of lie detector test, Dr. Teller. You know that such tests have never been admissible in court because they are unreliable. In this situation, involving extreme emotional stress, they would be even less reliable. They cannot be probative, of course, but many suspects in criminal cases undergo them simply to bolster their claims of innocence. If Mrs. McCarthy were to pass such a test, it would at least add weight to her claim that she is telling the truth, and it would show that she is not afraid to take the test. Why don't you just take a lie detector test, dearer? I asked her. 
Her eyes were drawn to me like iron filings to a magnet. What do you have to lose? Like Bailey said, if you want a divorce, you'll probably get one no matter what I do. If I really believed your story, I might agree to leave. There will be no lie detector tests, Bailey said. She looked at me with what seemed like real regret in her eyes. Why can't you believe me? Let me go so we can both move on with our lives. I can't believe you because you've told too many lies. Mr. McCarthy, I will ask you to remember that this meeting was called in part for your benefit, to allow you to negotiate a reasonable settlement that might otherwise cost you many thousands, if not more, in legal fees to resolve. One more comment in this spirit and we will be forced to reconsider the issue of continuation. Wills apparently took on the role of bad cop with gusto and enthusiasm. I stood up and pushed back my chair, as did Teller. Gentlemen, it was real. See you in court, in a real court, I said. Bailey gestured for me to sit down. Mr. McCarthy, Billy, let's stay calm. We won't achieve any benefit if we allow our emotions to run wild. Everyone sit down. We may have to discuss some sensitive issues. We probably will, I replied, but I think everyone understands that we'll all save a lot of money and hard feelings if we settle as many as possible today. He did a pretty good job of smoothing things over, but I had the advantage. I knew I could climb on the table and pee on his head, and they wouldn't let me leave. They needed my consent more than I needed anything from them. Now, Mr. McCarthy, Bailey continued, although my colleague may have been a little harsh, there is really no need to talk about lying. Regardless of who lied about what, it doesn't matter in a divorce case. But you see, this is where you are mistaken. My wife lied about important things. About things that hurt. And if you want to know why I am in no mood at all to be cooperative or reasonable, it is because I would like to expose these lies. Mr. McCarthy, Bailey said, no matter how much pleasure it may give you to air dirty laundry from your marriage, it serves no good purpose. It serves a purpose to keep me here. You invited me, and the longer I'm here, the more sure I am that you want something from me. Let's put everything on the table. He leaned over and spoke briefly to Wills in a whisper. Okay, Mr. McCarthy, we'll give you a chance to speak. Perhaps if we can figure out these questions, we can save everyone a lot of grief. Come on, continue. I took my phone and pressed button three, then sat back and waited, watching Deerer's face as it shifted from Bailey to Wills to the silver-haired lawyer to the female lawyer, but never on me, never on me. Five minutes later, Earl Wilson entered the room. He carried a briefcase and was dressed in office casual attire, gray trousers, polished black shoes, and a white shirt without a tie. He walked toward me and sat down, throwing his briefcase on the table. This is Mr. Earl Wilson, Wilson Investments. I could tell you about his qualifications, but I'm sure you've already used them or come across them. When I returned to the country and heard about Deerer's accident, I became interested. She's stubborn and reckless, but I've never known her to be careless behind the wheel. I knew that her father had trained her at a young age to be one of the best defensive driving specialists in the world. Not that he was worried about her joyrides, but the daughter of someone worth that kind of money should always be prepared for the possibility of a kidnapping or terrorist attack. We did some driving during our marriage, and I can honestly say she was a better driver than me. I wasn't that bad. As I spoke, she looked up again and stared at me. She knew that I knew. So, I hired Mr. Wilson to investigate the accident and my wife's general behavior before and after it. I'll let him continue. Wilson opened his briefcase and took out papers and photographs. I have reviewed the accident report and the associated photographs of the accident and injuries. For some reason, photos and diagrams were difficult to find. I was even told that they were lost or misplaced. However, I was able to locate them and make copies, which I have for your consideration, if you would like. The very first thing I noticed was the contradiction between the accident report and the photographs of the damage to the vehicle and Mrs. McCarthy's injuries. The police report states that Mrs. McCarthy was the driver and was alone in her vehicle at the time of the accident. The crash happened on Interstate 995, entering Jacksonville from St. Augustine. Mrs. McCarthy appeared to lose control of her vehicle at a fairly high speed and struck a power pole on the side of the road. He tapped his fingers on the polished wood and looked from Bailey to Wills, a small smile on his face. 
Bailey looked like he was about to growl, and Wills looked like he was about to suffer a brutal intestinal attack. Both of them knew what was about to happen. If you look at the photos of the damage to the car, most of the damage is on the right front side, not on the driver's side, which would have been the case if she had hit the power pole head on. It looks like the driver tried to swerve to the left, and most of the blood and other signs of the collision were on the right passenger side. I provided the evidence to two different accident experts, and both agreed that there is no way Mrs. McCarthy could have sustained her injuries if she had been driving the car. She must have been in the passenger seat at the time of the accident. I would say that this only proves that you've used the services of two low-level, so-called experts, Bailey said. I'm not an expert in accident reconstruction, but I've handled enough cases like this to imagine several ways in which a driver could have been ejected and still suffered the same injuries. Anyway, what does this have to do with anything we're discussing? Wills added. I gestured to Wilson, and he prepared to continue. As I did this, I looked at Deerer and saw it in her eyes. She looked like an animal whose pursuers were closing in, closing all avenues of escape. I didn't say a word in the increasingly quiet conference room, but I felt like she must have heard my thoughts. Asterisk you, why did you have to lie? If you'd just come to me and been honest, we could have made this work amicably, asterisk. Wilson leaned forward on the table and clasped his hands in mock prayer. Since it seemed almost certain that there were two people in Mrs. McCarthy's car, I wondered how it was that the police report said nothing about a second person. I talked to a lot of people. I found a police communications officer who told me that the accident was initially called a two-person incident, but after a few hours, any mention of the second man seemed to be forgotten. Now, Mrs. McCarthy was transported to Baptist Medical Center, and there was no record of another patient being transported from a motor vehicle accident at the same time but I checked other hospitals and learned that Julian Gutman was admitted to University Medical Center around the same time. Interestingly, he suffered injuries, including a broken rib and cuts to his face, which may have been caused by the explosion of the driver's side airbag. Wilson looked from Bailey to Wills and couldn't help but smile. Now, typically when a patient comes in from an accident, a police report is filed. But for some reason, I could not find any report about Gutman's accident. The only way I could imagine this happening is if someone were willing to throw around a lot of money to make sure that no reports were made, just to avoid embarrassment for all parties involved and it would require a lot of money and high-level connections, because if this became known, the officers responsible would be in deep trouble. Not even Sheriff Knight would be able to protect them, unless, of course, the orders to cover this up came from him, in which case, you're dealing with a major political scandal. This time, Bailey and Wilkes had nothing to say. And by the way, Julian Gutman is the one who seduced a girl, got her pregnant, had an abortion, and took a million dollars from her father so he could leave and never come back, I interjected. And then, as soon as her father was gone, he crawled back and started working on her again. I tried to get her to look at me, but she refused. It didn't matter. There's not much mystery about who was driving her car, is there? I asked trying to clarify the situation, or perhaps highlight what they'd done, or who, in fact, had used all this money and influence to make Julian disappear from history. You are very close to libel, Wilkes said. You're not dealing with public figures. You're even suggesting that our firm is conspiring to break the law. You'll be lucky if you end up just broke. I almost laughed out loud. If I didn't know how good Mr. Wilson is as an investigator, I might have trembled a little but whatever he comes up with will be absolutely reliable. And I think he can find enough evidence to cause you a lot of trouble. Yes, sir, Wilson said. I have received sufficient confirmation of Mr. Gutman's injuries and additional information about Mrs. McCarthy's condition, information that wasn't in any medical records. I found a nurse who said she and others were treating Mrs. McCarthy when she was brought in and noted the unusual nature of her injuries. Wilson paused for a moment, but no one spoke. Mrs. McCarthy did suffer injuries to her face, and there was a fair amount of blood. But while cleaning her wounds, the treating nurses discovered another substance mixed in with it. The nurse who told me the story said it was very obvious what the substance was. Deer had a natural ruddy complexion that any Irish girl would be proud of, but now her complexion was even redder. She didn't say anything. With a smile on my face, I asked Wilson, this might seem very unusual, wouldn't it? 
Did the nurses have any idea how this happened? Still smiling, Wilson said, well, there was some speculation that it was a divine accident, that an angelic being somehow fell onto her face during the accident. Or the attendant in the ambulance could have done the dirty deed without two other employees, including one female paramedic, having any idea what happened. Or Mrs. McCarthy and Mr. Gutman may have had Intim in the car before the accident. I'll leave it to you gentlemen to decide what the consensus was among the medical staff. He leafed through another package. After it turned out they were together that night, I started tracking them down. Fortunately, Mrs. McCarthy's security staff installed GPS trackers in all of her personal and company vehicles to protect her in the event of kidnapping or terrorism. These are, of course, not open to public viewing, but through a series of fortunate coincidences, I was able to gain access to them. They showed that the two had spent some time at Neptune's Cave, a bar on St. Augustine Beach. He smiled as he discussed the lucky coincidence that I knew would anger Bailey and Wilkes. He was very good at figuring out things he shouldn't know anything about. The only thing he was better at was wiretapping. I was able to find witnesses who observed them being very close while they were there for several hours. They were seen leaving the establishment together, heavily intoxicated, and allegedly returning to Jacksonville, where Mr. Gutman was located, living in an apartment bought for him by Mrs. McCarthy. That's enough, Bailey said, and although he was quiet, he silenced the room. We have already discussed the fact that nothing you've said can be proven, and yet it has no bearing on the future of the divorce. I'm not going to comment on whether Miss Lancaster might have had a relationship with Mr. Gutman, because if she did, it wouldn't matter. Adultery has no meaning in today's world, where children don't matter and support or alimony doesn't matter. He reached out and grabbed Deer's hand in a gesture of support. There may be different opinions regarding the memory loss she experienced, but no matter what you believe, it doesn't affect her request for divorce. So, despite all the extraneous issues you've raised, the central issue we have to resolve is how we can most painlessly end your marriage. I guess you weren't listening when I said I didn't want a divorce and I would fight you as long as I could, I said. My wife wouldn't run around with this piece of crap who got her pregnant and then ran like a scared rabbit when her father waved money in front of him. Even if I didn't love her, I would fight the divorce just to piss him off and her. Is it worth spending the kind of money you'd have to spend to make your ex-wife angry? Bailey asked. Money won't be a problem for me, I said. Wills looked at me knowingly and said, so you're planning to kill your ex-wife because she's rich, in a marriage that has only lasted two years, where the partners have spent most of that time apart? I don't think you can expect a significant settlement of any kind. No, I just want to get what's due to me, if Deer insists on a divorce. What is owed to you? Wills asked, with obvious disbelief. Of course, he knew better, but all good lawyers must have acting talent. Many of them could have made it on the silver screen if they hadn't had to take such a big pay cut to become movie stars. Yes, Mr. Wills and Mr. Bailey, what is due to me? The real reason we are here today. We can continue to play games, but I know what's at stake. I always knew. We can do this for hours, but why not get down to business? If you know why we're here, why go through all this? Bailey said, pointing to Wilson and Teller. I wanted to see if, at some point, she could look me in the eyes, if she had any conscience left. If the girl I thought I knew was still alive. Now the answer is obvious. Both Teller and Wilson looked at me curiously. They played their roles, but did not know how it would end. I feel like I came here in the middle of a movie, Wilson said, and thought I knew the plot of the whole story. Do you mind? I asked Bailey. He shrugged. This whole meeting was never about Deer wanting a divorce and you refusing her, or about this amnesia she claims. I always knew the amnesia was fake and would have given her a divorce any time. But she could not divorce me in the current conditions. How could you know? For the first time, she looked at me without lowering her gaze. And just for a moment, I saw the woman I once knew. It was simple. Dear, when I came back, you acted like you'd never seen me before. You knew who I was, because people showed you my picture, of course. But you said you'd never seen me in person. Your father told me when he first asked me to look after you that you had a crush on me when I was young. I didn't notice you at all, but you noticed me. You might not remember our date or our marriage, 
but you couldn't completely forget the guy you fell in love with the first time. And when you seemed to completely forget about me, I realized the amnesia wasn't real. From there, it was a matter of investigating and placing enough bugs in different places to gather clues. I turned back to the legal army at the other end of the table. I stood up and started pacing. What I couldn't understand at first was why Deer decided to feign amnesia. As you noted, gentlemen, I couldn't stop her from getting a divorce if she really wanted it. And honestly, Deer, as soon as I found out you were dating that piece of crap, Gutman, I would have let you go. I walked up behind Deer, and she tensed but didn't move. The silver-haired young lawyer began to rise, but Bailey shook his head and motioned for him to remain seated. It's okay, Matt, I said. I put my hands on her shoulders and squeezed lightly. She refused to turn and look at me. But when I realized it was Gutman with whom you were cheating, everything fell into place. I understand why you came up with the amnesia plan. It was pretty smart. It wouldn't have worked, but it was inventive and showed imagination. I knew it had to be your idea. Gutman is too damn stupid to come up with something like that. I usually like mysteries where the detective gets all the suspects in one room and lays out the whole conspiracy, Wilson said. But I have to admit, I'm still completely in the dark. I felt that some of Bailey's staff were also completely lost. I really don't know what's going on here. My dramatic gesture of standing behind Deer and placing my hands on her shoulders backfired on me. I felt the warmth of her skin under my fingers and remembered what that tender flesh was like when we were skin to skin. It was becoming increasingly difficult to restrain myself from stroking her, and I wasn't sure if I could let her go, even knowing what she did to me. The tactile memory of our nights together grew stronger. Because you don't have all the facts, Wilson, I said. The most important of these is that Mr. Lancaster was concerned our marriage would have a good chance of success, so he introduced some prenuptial conditions into the marriage, legal terms that both Deer and I had to agree to and sign. Simply put, for every year of marriage, I was due a one million dollar settlement. In the tenth year of marriage, we may or may not have divorced, but the money had to be transferred to my account. If the marriage ended due to Deer's infidelity, I would receive an automatic payment of ten million dollars. If the marriage ended before the tenth year, for any reason other than my infidelity, I would receive ten million dollars. There was a noticeable silence in the room. The mention of a $10 million divorce settlement was significant enough, even in Hollywood or the Hamptons. Now, the $10 million marriage fine that Lancaster apparently put in place to try to keep his daughter away from money-hungry men while she was married might have a deterrent effect on most people, but not on Deer. She had always been a very spoiled rich girl, and I knew that she would probably pay it forward in a heartbeat to find happiness with Gutman. That soft flesh under my fingers could have turned to warm stone. But Julian Gutman was a completely different story. Julian came from a lower middle class family, and a million dollars was serious money to him. Ten million? I doubt he could even count that high. The thought of me walking away with ten million dollars of his money when he married Deer must have driven him crazy. No, this was all a ploy to somehow get around paying me the ten million dollars that Lancaster wanted me to receive in case Gutman came back into his daughter's life. Deer had to break her father's will to please her lover, and the thought of what else she did to satisfy him disgusted me. I bowed my head. The fact that you did all this for him is the most offensive thing. Without turning her head or moving an inch, she whispered, Let me go, Michael. Just let go. I managed to unclench my hands and stepped back. I had to do it, and I'd been in enough bar fights to sense that Matt, whatever his name was, was getting ready to get up and do something stupid. I wonder if he had also tasted Deer's pleasures. But Lancaster told me that when she was with Gutman, she had no eyes for anyone else. Most likely, it was a simple nightly arm. She was the kind of woman you wanted to do things for. I was an inch taller than Matt, and he was a lawyer, damn it. But like I said, I had developed certain instincts, and I felt he might be tougher than he looked. I stepped back and raised my hands in a peace gesture. And in this fantasy of yours, how does Miss Lancaster's amnesia help this matter? Bailey asked. He didn't look truly unhappy, this was an intelligence operation, and now they knew that I knew. Wilson sat back in his very comfortable chair and said, Hey, guys, I'm an outsider, and even I can answer that question. 
Lancaster was a devout Catholic, like you, Mr. Bailey. The McCarthys were married in the Catholic Church, with Monsignor Gerald Alcott in attendance, and I know that the head of the Catholic Diocese rarely conducts private weddings, so he's obviously close to the Lancaster family. I'm not a Catholic, but I've worked on some divorce cases in Catholic marriages. The Catholic Church is not very fond of divorce, but there are a few exceptions, and annulments may be granted for a variety of reasons. They are not given out like Halloween candy, but the Church does allow them. I would suggest that if Mrs. McCarthy came to the bishop with her sad story of a very short marriage without children, ending with her forgetting everything about the last three years and becoming a stranger to a man who wants to spend nights in her bed, he would at least be inclined to listen to her plea. Maybe, Bailey said, now smiling, and I didn't like it. But gentlemen, even if you think that my respectable company has engaged in such vices, what about the civil courts? Mr. McCarthy can continue to fight there, and Catholic doctrine doesn't carry much weight there. I accepted that smile. I had a feeling that Bailey wasn't used to losing, and he wasn't going to tell me that his firm was going to do the right thing and give me what Lancaster wanted me to get if Gutman came back into his daughter's life. Why do I get the feeling that you're not very concerned about what I'm planning to do? Wilson said astutely. Smart too, Orion told me. He's smarter than he looks. People think he's just a big rude guy, but he has the brains to make oil money one day. It turned out he was right. Did you know this was a show, Mr. McCarthy? I think you know what I'm talking about. We wanted to find out what you know, what you've done, and what you're likely to do in the future. You were much more willing to share information in an informal setting. We found out what we wanted to know, and since there's no need to continue the show, let's begin the real discussion. He pointed to Teller and then to Wilson. You gentlemen will no longer need to stay here. McCarthy, why don't you let them go? I don't think he stood up from his chair, his place of power, but he walked the length of the table, finally leaning casually against it. Fine, let's summarize, he said. You believe your wife is faking her amnesia after a very real and serious car accident. You have a psychiatrist who shares this opinion. We believe Miss Lancaster suffered real and serious brain damage in the horrific accident. No one, in our opinion, would subject themselves to such trauma for the sake of faking it, which she didn't need in any case. He pointed at Wilson. You hired a private investigator who gathered information that casts doubt on Miss Lancaster's account of the accident, but you can't prove anything regarding the details of the accident or the alleged malpractice of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. You can prove that she dated Mr. Gutman while still married to you, but from a legal standpoint, so what? Her relationship with Mr. Gutman is and remains completely legal. It happens. People fall in and out of love all the time. Obviously, she's not going to try to reconcile, and she will do everything in her power, and ours, to ensure that you do not receive the $10 million stipulated in the marriage documents. He ran his hand over his bald, shiny head. Does that pretty much sum up the situation? Yes, almost. Besides, you missed the most important point, I said. I will be awarded this $10 million no matter what legal tricks and schemes you're going to use to break the prenuptial agreement. You will lose. Bailey stood up and came close enough to touch me. For a man over 60, he was in pretty good shape. He looked at his army of employees, waved, and an older woman, dark-haired and still attractive, stood up and brought him a document. Thank you, Marge, he said. She swayed her hips slightly as she walked by, and the look in Bailey's eyes told me there was more than just legal business here. When the two of them were alone in the office, it was reassuring to know that there was still life south of the border, even in later years. He handed me the document. As you will see, this is an agreement to waive any claims for the $10 million in exchange for an immediate payment of $250,000. You can sign this right now, Mr. McCarthy, and receive $250,000 today. Miss Lancaster can get her uncontested divorce within a month, and you two can resume your separate lives. I couldn't help but smile. You obviously think I'm an idiot. Why should I do this? Because you won't have any other choice, he said moving to the center of the room and making a sweeping gesture that covered the entire room. You joked at the beginning of this meeting about the discrepancy between our firm and yours. 
Remember, you compared yourself to General George Custer at the Battle of the Little Big Horn. Again, you were insightful. It wasn't a joke, this is your situation. You were in the minority, underprepared for the legal battle that is about to break out around you. I know you think you're on the moral high ground and that this will allow you to win, but it only emphasizes your naivety. Legal battles are won by the stronger side, and compared to Miss Lancaster, you're not even an ant against an army. You'll hurt my feelings if you continue like this. This is not a joke. Think about it. According to our data, collected from completely legitimate sources, you have a bank account and assets worth approximately $35,000. You owe almost $75,000, but Dr. Teller's fees aren't cheap, and Mr. Wilson took a significant portion of your money for his fee and cash for information. Miss Lancaster, through her personal wealth and 100% ownership of Oil Inc., is worth approximately $150 million. You don't even have a representative in court. She has at least 50 of them working for her business. You have one detective, no matter how good he is. We have 10 detectives looking into every aspect of your life and marriage. You would think that, as Miss Lancaster's current husband, you'd have access to some of her funds, but that is not the case. We have blocked access to the estate's funds, and any alimony that a foolish judge might award is frozen until the case is resolved. It will take years, years and years. We will fight to keep this case alive as long as possible. We will fight for annulments and the dissolution of marriages on the grounds of abuse and domestic violence. The divorce will be so entangled with various criminal matters that it will take a long time to untangle all the knots. After a while, you will run out of funds for detectives, experts, and any decent legal assistance. You will lose. You will lose $10 million. You will lose your marriage. You will lose representation, and you may lose your freedom. I can't wait to find out what terrible things I did to my innocent wife. I couldn't sit still. I walked around Bailey, and when Matt started to rise to block my path, I pushed him down, much harder than necessary. I grabbed Dar's chair by the back and turned it so she couldn't hide from me. I guess I never knew you, Darer. I expected you to fight like a lioness for Gutman, but to destroy me in order to give him this $10 million wedding gift. Would you stoop so low for a damn idiot who forced you to kill your child and then allowed himself to be bribed to leave you? It's a good thing your father is dead, because it would break his heart to see how low you've fallen. Just sign the papers, Michael. We're done. Take $250,000 and get out of my life. The problem, Michael, is that you've been brainwashed by all these movies and TV courtroom shows, Wilk said, coming up behind me. The courtroom is not some bloodless arena where legal arguments are tested and weighed to determine the truth. This is a battlefield. Once upon a time, people fought and died in the fields to determine which side God would bless. Today, we use words and books and evidence, but it's still a battle. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, Bailey added. We will bombard you, inundate you with petitions and a whole forest of legal documents. We will break you. We will send one lawyer after another so that you, an ordinary person who does not know the law, will not even be able to answer adequately. We will drown you. We will break you. Bailey stood behind Darer, his hands on her shoulders where mine had just been. And that's not the worst part, Michael. We will not play by the rules of the Marquis of Queensbury. This is a barehanded fight. Thur told us how you attacked her the first night her father entrusted her safety to you. You pill at her, and when she resisted, you smashed her lip with your fist. We have evidence from several of her friends that when they tried to intervene to protect her because they saw you had pilled her, you sent them to the hospital with serious injuries. For men tried to stop you, and you beat them to a pulp. What chance did a 105-pound girl have to protect herself from you? And after you took advantage of her the first time, you continued to dominate her by threatening to use your friends to convince her father that she was an easy girl, having an intim with any number of men. Although she admits that she was wild, she did not want to hurt her father by hearing your lies about her behavior. He looked down at Darer, then around the assembled men and women of his staff. Sorry, Darer. I know you didn't want anyone to know these embarrassing details but it is necessary for Michael to know how far you're willing to go to end your marriage. And why did you marry such a monster, Darer? 
Why did you marry me and stay with me for two years if I was such a terrible person? She stood up like a fiery queen, and for a moment, I could believe her claims that she had fairy blood in her veins. Because you are a cruel and dangerous man, Michael McCarthy, and you knew how I felt about Julian. Even after my father kicked him out, you swore to me that if I didn't marry you and let you take over my father's company, you would find Julian and beat him to death with your bare hands. And I believed you. I knew exactly what she was doing, and it still hit me like a hard fist in the center of my chest. Sign the paper and finish this, Wilk said behind me. You're not only facing financial ruin, the statute of limitations has not yet expired for assault, pilling, or other criminal charges. It can get really ugly. Hasn't it gotten ugly already? This could get a lot worse, Michael. Don't make it go that way. Wilk placed the paper on the table and laid a gold and silver enamel pen next to it. It looked real. Sign, Mr. McCarthy. You are not a stupid person. You are good at what you do. You've already lost your wife. You can walk away with a quarter of a million dollars and start a new life, or you can struggle and waste years of your life and possibly ruin your life. It's an easy decision. Teller silently watched what was happening. He reached into his pocket, pulled out something that looked like a mint candy, and popped it into his mouth. The way he did this made me think he was a heavy smoker who had recently quit. This was typical behavior for former smokers. Mr. McCarthy, I'm not going to tell you what you should do. This is your life. But I will say that it does not take a licensed psychiatrist to understand that this meeting was organized for one purpose, to confuse you and make it difficult for you to think straight. This is the civilian version of the famous shock and awe doctrine that the U.S. Army used so skillfully in Iraq last year. The idea is to overwhelm you. Next to him, Wilson raised his finger as if to attract my attention. I'm no lawyer, McCarthy, but I know that wills and prenuptial agreements are difficult to revoke, especially when they're written for someone with Lancaster's fortune. Of course, these documents were drawn up by the person who is now going to challenge them, so they might have better luck. But Mr. Bailey and Wills will have to be careful, because lawyers go to jail for crap like this. Bailey smiled as if the thought of prison amused him. Your friends are not lawyers, Michael. Listen to someone who is a lawyer with many years of experience. Not signing will be the biggest mistake of your life. I stood looking at the legal army he had assembled against me, the tip of the spear of an unstoppable legal machine that he said would destroy me. It was a sobering sight and that's why my smile puzzled everyone. Wills and Bailey exchanged glances as if wondering if I was crazy. Darer studied me carefully, and I saw a realization dawn within her. She didn't know exactly what was coming, but after two years and many energetic nights in bed, she had gotten to know me well enough to know that a storm was brewing, and the worst was near. She tensed in her seat, but there was nowhere to run. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Wills, you are right that my two friends are not lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. I do not have a lawyer to represent my interests, but I have a lawyer. Well, sort of. He works on a voluntary basis, it doesn't cost me a penny, but he's a good lawyer. He knows you. Let me call him. I took my cell phone and dialed a number. There was no point in talking. Thirty seconds later, phones in front of the half-dozen chairs began to ring. Bailey and Wills were far from their chairs, so a chorus of Mr. Bailey, Mr. Wills filled the room. The police are downstairs. They ordered everyone to stay in their offices. They arrested Mr. Stevens. They're taking the elevator. Bailey and Wills told their employees to calm down and hang up. Bailey shook his head. I don't know what kind of dirty trick you're up to, McCarthy, but you're playing with fire. I will tear apart any cheap ambulance chaser you bring here and spit them out. I am a longtime supporter of Sheriff Knight. I donated to all of his campaigns, and when I tell him about his officers' involvement, they will have to endure disciplinary action if they stay on their jobs at all. I heard footsteps in the corridor. The door opened, and first one, then another and then a third Jacksonville Sheriff's Department officer walked through the door. Behind them walked Mr. Harper Stevens, his hands cuffed behind his back, followed by another thug in the uniform of a Sheriff's Department officer. The last person to enter was an unremarkable short man in civilian clothes who crept almost unnoticed in the rear. 
While everyone watched the uniformed officers and their thug counterparts, most of the staff were watching the cops. Bailey, Wills, gray-haired Matt, and every other real lawyer kept their eyes on the short guy in civilian clothes. He was not a figure at the sight of whom criminals would tremble in fear. His clothes were of good quality, but his white shirt was bulging over his stomach and there were visible gaps between the top buttons. His thinning hair was a shade of what might be called mousy brown, but the thick daytime stubble was black, making him look like a drunk reeling from a 48-hour bender. Any Irishman would immediately recognize him as a representative of the black Irish. Nothing else was suitable, but the thick black stubble marked him indelibly. His name was William Matland, and he was the second most senior prosecutor in the state attorney's office in the 3rd Judicial District. And he was my ace in the hole. Matland? Bailey exclaimed, clearly not believing his eyes. What the hell is going on here? Hello, Mort, Wills said. I could ask you the same question. I've never seen so many lawyers gathered in one room, except at a bar meeting when free alcohol is being handed out. You almost didn't have enough staff down there to prevent us from making arrests. I had to leave several officers below to stop them from escaping to Mexico or Canada. And this is not a joke. You're right, Mort. This is a raid, Wills said. Come on, Wills, you have to talk to make it interesting. Repeating my words won't create any headlines on the evening news. You've always been a sensational, cold-blooded idiot, but this time you've gone too far. You've bitten off more than you can chew. Matlin smiled as if he knew a joke that no one else understood. Ah, Mort, I always thought you loved me, Matlin said. Bailey grabbed the phone from the table. Give me your boss's number. And if you work in the prosecutor's office tomorrow, I will be very surprised. Mr. Edwards is in Tallahassee today and is busy, but I have his number and you should probably contact him. Bailey dialed the number pressed the button, and a voice came from the other end. I want it on speakerphone, idiot, so everyone can hear your head being blown off. Hello? There's only a minute, I'm getting ready for the meeting. Dallas, this is Mort Bailey. Oh, hi, Mort. Hopefully, this is something we can talk about later. We need to talk about this right now. Do you know what Matlin is doing in my office right now? No, but I know why he's there. He told me he had received some disturbing information about your company. He was going to come to your office to clear up some things. He burst into my office with armed police, handcuffed my security guard, and said it was a raid. Since when do your subordinates walk around law offices? Matland is a very responsible, balanced guy. He wouldn't have come there if he didn't think there was a reason for it. He burst into my office with armed police in the middle of an important meeting. I didn't expect this from your people. I have supported your service since you first ran for office. I defended your work among my colleagues, and I've given you a lot of money over the years for your campaigns, never asking for anything in return. I deserve better treatment. You've been a friend and supporter for many years, and I value our friendship, but I could not ignore the information Matland conveyed to me. I'm sure you can work things out. Give Matland your assistance, and he will work with you. Now they're calling me back. I'm sure everything will work out, and we can meet for lunch next week when I'm back in town. There was a loud click, like thunder, in the silence of the room. Mort, it seems your good friend just threw you to the wolves, and I'm the wolf, Matlin said. Bailey and Will slowly and carefully returned to their seats, like old men unsure of their gait. Bailey looked around at the officers. You have power now, Matlin, but the time will come when you will not have it. Dallas Edwards will regret what he just did, and you will regret it even sooner. I have friends in the association, and the association in Tallahassee would never approve of what you just did. Having Edwards cover for you won't work this time. I will hold you accountable for your misconduct, and you'll be lucky if you're convicted. Maybe. But for now, let's focus on more pressing matters. He pulled out a chair next to Teller and sat down. He pointed at me. A few days ago, Mr. McCarthy came to me with very serious accusations, fraud to defraud $10 million, solicitation of perjury, filing false and falsified legal documents, criminal omission, negligence, and any other crime you could think of, among other things. Mr. McCarthy, play your recording. It was cheap and petty of me, 
but as I pressed play, I couldn't help but smile at the far end of the table. I think it was the so-called get drunk and get drunk grin, and it was nice. I couldn't help but glance at Wilson for a second, but his face was unreadable. It's always helpful in a divorce case to have a guy on your side who must have been for military intelligence. Darer, you have nothing to be afraid of. I know this is hard for you. You've been married to this man for two years. There will inevitably be feelings of guilt for what you are doing, but you're doing a great job. No need for an Oscar, just stick to your story that you don't remember those three years. Dr. Fairfax wrote a report that backs up your story. We paid him too much money, and we made the report on the Gutman incident disappear. There is nothing that can officially link him to this incident. I can't, Uncle Mort. I feel disgusting. What I'm doing to stop Michael from getting his $10 million is one thing. I begged Julian to let it go. We don't need this, but he doesn't want to. Between you and me, it seems to me that it's not about the money, but that he hates Michael because I married him, not because he needs those $10 million. I think he just wants to punish Michael. And even worse, I don't want to do everything you plan. Accuse Michael of assaulting, beating up the guys I hung out with, and threatening me? None of this is true, and you know it. Even so, what we're doing is bad, but I'm not going to send him to prison. We won't need it, and I don't plan on that, but we had to prepare the charges. We've bought witnesses who will corroborate the story and even testify in court if it comes to that. But that won't happen. We do this so that we don't have to go to court. Michael is not stupid. When he sees the hell we're ready to bring down on his head, he'll take $250,000 and disappear. I promise you, he'll give up and leave. I pressed the off button. Nice plan, Mort, and it might work, Matlin said. But he's stubborn and won't give up. Bailey stared at the tape recorder on the table as if it were a huge cockroach that had suddenly crawled out from under the table. You're crazy, Mond. I may not like some of your methods but I never thought you were a fool. A legal recording of a private conversation? Are you basing this all on illegal wiretapping? This is a crime in itself and will never be accepted in court. I bow to your superior knowledge of the law, Mort. You're right, maybe technically I can't use this wiretap in court, but if you remember the Inano case of 1985, you know that a person who breaks the law has no right to privacy. And you were definitely breaking every law possible when this conversation took place. We may not be able to present this as evidence, but we can use it. Another good feature of illegal wiretaps is that, while we're not conducting them, we can use them to obtain evidence that will be accepted in court. Mond pulled his mobile phone out of his pocket and pressed a button. Bring the good doctor and the bad boyfriend here. Bailey and Wills' eyes widened as the meaning of Matlin's words dawned on them. Darer's eyes sparkled under the light of the lamps. I knew she never expected it to go this far. I was wondering how hard Bailey had to push to get her here today. She'd done her best to avoid me ever since she started faking amnesia. A few moments later, the door opened, and a tall, distinguished man, looking as if he had slept in his rumpled, smart Mayfair suit, entered the room, followed by a taller, younger man in shorts and a t-shirt that read, Teachers can conjugate verbs all night. A uniformed officer poked his head in the door, but Mond waved him off. Mond motioned for Dr. Mayfair to sit in the center of the table, which was already beginning to fill. Before he could point out Gutman, my wife's lover almost lifted one of the secretaries and moved her to another chair while he sat down next to Darer. They exchanged glances, and then he leaned down. I expected him to kiss her on the cheek for encouragement, but he kissed her on the lips. A few people looked, but most turned away. Finally, he broke the kiss. He looked me in the eye and smiled. I didn't have to read between the lines to understand his message. My wife is now his woman, and he just proved it. Okay, he was handsome, almost femininely beautiful. He wore his hair long and had a diamond stud in his left ear. A couple of lawyers and secretaries couldn't take their eyes off him. If I'm very lucky, before this is all over, I might be able to permanently rebuild those perfect facial features. Good afternoon, Dr. Mayfair said, Mon having difficulty choosing clothes today. Mayfair had long hair, dark glasses, and was so clean-shaven his face looked like it had been plucked. His hair was streaked when I thought it should have been gray. Basically, 
he looked like an older version of every handsome TV doctor. He looked like a kind uncle whom you could trust with your dark secrets. Today, he looked like the drunk, pill-addicted uncle who always shows up at family gatherings out of his mind. The one who always borrows money and never pays it back and who always has to be bailed out at the most inconvenient moments. Your least favorite uncle. Yet outwardly, he remained the same as he was in his professional shell, but inside, inside everything was rotten. He didn't even look in Matlin's direction. Instead, his gaze darted like a wounded butterfly from Wills to Bailey and back again. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Wills, excuse me, I, I had no choice. They told me I was going to jail. I had to speak. I had to tell them. I don't care about the... You told them? Bailey said. We both know you wrote an honest report without any interference or payment from us. I know Mond is good at intimidating witnesses, and he still has that fabricated good guy reputation. I don't know how he intimidated you, but if he got you to sign false documents, you're in serious trouble. The first rule of any crooked lawyer when you're in trouble is to lie, Matlin said. You do it so well that I almost think you're crooked. And the fabricated good guy reputation. I've always considered myself a good guy, Mayfair said, trying to regain his footing. Play your games, Matlin. You have one illegal entry and one forced false confession. You have nothing. I beg to differ, but then I am biased in favor of the truth. One of your problems is that you don't realize how deep you are in this quagmire because you are a civil lawyer. You've never worked in criminal law. From my point of view, it won't be difficult to pin you down. We can use the recording to convince reluctant witnesses where their personal benefit lies, and the documents signed by Dr. Mayfair are sufficient to obtain search warrants for your office, review all your records, examine your telephone records, and follow the trail of the police and medical professionals you used in your scheme. Bailey stood up. A couple of minutes of recovery gave him the opportunity to regain his confidence. You're too used to dealing with criminal rabble, Mond. If you don't have anything better than this, get your cops and leave. And uncuff Mr. Harper Stevens. Matlin turned to the Hispanic officer standing next to Bailey. Stu, if Mr. Bailey doesn't shut up and sit down, handcuff him and sit him down. After Bailey sat down, Mond walked over to where the silver-haired lawyer, Matt, was sitting. Mr. Henry, why don't you walk with me to the other side of the room? Henry and Bailey exchanged glances, then Henry stood up and walked to the very right side of the room, as far away from the table as he could get, but not so far that he couldn't hear every word. Matt, I make it my business to know about the lawyers in my county, even the civil lawyers. I've heard good things about you. You are smart. You work hard, and you're a good lawyer. I'm sure that's why Morton Wills hired you. They don't take losers. Henry smiled faintly, and for a moment, it was difficult to realize that Mon was shorter. Why do I feel like you're going to tell me to turn around and bend over? I'm not going to with you, Matt. In fact, I'm going to save you from royal foolishness. Why are you so kind to me, Mr. Mond? It's like... I don't know. I don't know how much you know about what happened here with this scheme to defraud Mr. McCarthy out of the $10 million he was owed, but I know that you are too smart and too involved in this company not to at least know about part of this. I know that you are the core. I don't think any of the other lawyers are ready to come forward. They either rose into middle management and have houses, mortgages, child support payments, or kids in college, or they are green. But secretaries and assistants are small fish, and they're afraid the system will swallow them. But if you come to us, everything will fall apart. You are the obvious successor, and everyone, including you, knows it. If you testify in court, there will be no charges or stains on your reputation. You'll be an honest informant who helped expose a corrupt company. Sure, maybe no local firm will want to hire you, but my boss knows everyone in the legal field here and in many other places. You'll get a very high recommendation from him as an honest lawyer, and there are firms that really value that. Henry did not look back at his superiors for support. I appreciate your offer, but I think the case against Mr. Bailey and Wills is complete nonsense. I have no knowledge of this firm's unethical or illegal behavior and, therefore, cannot help you. Mond ran a hand through his thinning hair and stared at the floor for a moment. 
Without looking up, he began to speak so quietly that you had to strain to hear him, and twenty-five pairs of ears strained to hear him. I respect loyalty. I value honesty, and I highly appreciate any man or woman who does the right thing when the right thing needs to be done. But of all these qualities, and this is probably my weakness, the one I value most is loyalty. Even misguided devotion, even devotion to bad deeds and bad people who do not deserve this devotion. He bit his lip and then rubbed his bottom lip with his thumb. I had the feeling these were nervous tics common to him, but he was using them to make it seem as though he was being forced to convey bad news that he didn't want to convey. And that's why I respect you, Matt. But before you make your final decision, think for a moment. That's all I ask. Listen to me for a moment. In your heart of hearts, you know that Bailey and Wills, and perhaps the other partners, are going down. They will talk lip service, but as soon as there is written evidence and changes in charges, people will start to give in. They always do. Bailey and Wills are both over 60. Most of Wills' children are now adults. For white-collar crimes, even for stealing $10 million, they won't get more than five years, and they have enough money to live on, even if they never practice again. Darer, Lancaster, and her lover may not go to prison, although I will do everything to put them there because it's all on them. But even if they spend a few years in the comfort of their cell, she'll still have $150 million left when they get out, and that's just an obstacle in the way. But you, Matt, this is the end of the road for you. You're 32 years old, unmarried, and probably have half a million in legal expenses, which will eat up a significant portion of it. You will be judged because I'm as sure they will drag you in to share the blame as I am that the sun will rise tomorrow. Your license will be revoked. No serious company, probably not even a K in Chaga, would want a person convicted of fraud and theft of $10 million to work for them. He stepped back from Henry and looked around the room. No one spoke, and all eyes were on the couple. Mon looked Henry up and down. You're a nice young man, Matt, Mon said. Matlin laughed when he saw the expression on Henry's face. Relax, Matt. I'm not suggesting another way for you to get out of harm's way, so to speak. I'm just saying you're a nice young man. I have no information about you being gay, so I'm guessing you like and date women. Most likely, someday, some cutie will drag you into marriage, and after a while, children will appear. If you're like most men, you'll want the best for your wife and children. This is usually what happens. As a lawyer, an aspiring and talented lawyer, you can provide your family with a good life, opportunities, travel, college. As a disbarred ex-con, you'll still want what's best for them, but you won't be able to offer them what you could now. If you remain loyal to your bosses, you will not only throw your life away, but you will also deprive your family of the future. You will sacrifice your entire life, your future, for people who will come out of this with no real scars. Mon came closer and put his hand on Henry's shoulder. For the first time, it was clear how short Mon was. Just think about it. This is the most important decision of your life, and it will shape your entire life, Matt. Think long and hard. The two men stood their ground for a moment, then Henry retreated. He shook his head as if shaking off a dream or a nightmare. I've heard several stories about you, Mond. I've always heard that you're good, damn, you're good, but I'm afraid you've wasted your talents on me. I still don't know anything about the $10 million scam or theft. He turned his back on Mond and returned to his place at the table. Mond simply shook his head for a moment, then returned to where Bailey was sitting. I don't know how much you pay him, Mort, but you don't pay him enough. He looked around the table. I know everyone here heard this conversation. The same conditions apply. Come forward and you will leave without charges, without trial, without a stain from all this. But the offer cannot last forever. If you wait too long, the proposal, or proposals, will be taken off the table. Henry, this applies to you too. It won't take long for this offer to disappear. Other witnesses may not be as valuable, but a few of them will probably be sufficient. Don't wait too long. I looked around the table. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't a trained investigator. But I'd been in enough high-stakes negotiations around the world to know a little about people. People were nervous, figuring out their best moves. 
I didn't think anyone would come forward in this room, but I doubted it would be too long before the first contacts were made with Mon's office. Gutman held Deer's hand tightly, and now he did not grin as he looked at me. He, too, was thinking about prison and how, even with Dar's $150 million protection, he would be a very attractive target for guys who liked men who looked like very beautiful women. We must have been on the same page. He looked at me as I stared at him, and I blew him a kiss. Only Deer's grip kept him in place. He wanted a piece of me, and oh God, I wanted a piece of him. If only he was man enough to climb over the table to me. But that would be too much to hope for. Taking my eyes off him, I studied Bailey and Wills. Neither of them gave up. Today did not go as they expected and did not go as I had hoped. Mon seemed to have made up his mind. Waving to the policeman named Stu, he said. Okay, Mort, if you don't even want to consider some kind of plea deal, let's move on. Turn around and put your hands behind your back, Stu, handcuff him, then shackle Wills. You're crazy, Mond. Are you going to lead us out in handcuffs with just this? It's sad to see a career end like this, and yours will end today. I notified the media, a good, old-fashioned escorted exit is exactly what the local 6 o'clock news loves. Finally, Bailey turned around and put his hands behind his back. You're an idiot, Mond. You always have been and always will be. Mond looked at the floor for a moment, then looked at me and finally at Bailey. Bailey was just as clearly puzzled as everyone else, except me and Mond. You disappointed me, Mort. I really hoped you would cry and beg for mercy on your knees, but you're a stubborn, which puts me in a bad position. Maitland sat down at the table on my side. Stu, the rest of the guys can wait downstairs, have some coffee or something. We may still have to arrest someone. Grove, you can take Mr. Reeves downstairs and, if he calms down, uncuff him too. What the hell? Before Mond could respond, Harper Stevens clasped his hands even tighter behind his back. Mr. Bailey, can I please, please put that damn Yankee's head in his ass? Damn special forces buggers think they're special. One SAS man could handle five of them on any given day. Grove turned to Mond. Let me deal with him. In five minutes, the only reason you're talking now is because my hands are cuffed behind my back. Try to say it when my hands are free. Do we really need to organize these showdowns now? Now is not the best time. The big cop looked at Mond. I volunteer to help you, Mr. Mond, because you helped me in the past, but I'll still kick his fifth place whether it's here or in some alley. Can you call your dog off? Bailey replied, why should I do anything for you, Mond? You're a crazy maniac with too much power. I have no idea what you're doing here. Mond responded, everything will become clear in a few minutes. And if these two start a fight, we'll have two people badly injured or dead. If your man kills mine, I'll have to arrest him for murder, and I'm sure his family will sue you for his actions. He works for you. And if my man kills yours, at best, he'll get a manslaughter charge. The two thugs looked at each other. Finally, Harper Stevens said, there are back steps at the bottom. If you take me there, one of us might accidentally trip and get hurt, completely by accident. No blows to the head, no intentional injuries. The first one who is unable to continue or lose his consciousness, that's it, it's done. Agreed? Let's get out of here. Are you satisfied, gentlemen? I don't know what you're talking about. You just leave. You don't need our permission to do this. The two men walked out the door, chatting like old friends. For a few seconds, I think everyone was trying to hear something from behind the door, but nothing was heard. I repeat, Mond, what's going on here? Bluff. You put on your show, I put on my own show. Neither of us was particularly successful. I knew it was all nonsense. Your career is over. Not really. He looked at me. McCarthy, for the last time, don't do this. I know why you're doing this, but she's not worth it. We've already talked before. I couldn't explain it then, and I knew I couldn't now. Mon was a smart man, but he didn't walk in my shoes. He didn't love Deer or Lancaster, and he'll never understand. You're the luckiest idiot I know, Mort, Maitland said. You too, Wills. 
it was obvious that neither of them had the slightest idea what he was talking about. You can avoid jail, disbarment, the end of your firm, and your legal career just because the man you worked so hard to scam out of $10 million still loves his wife. Deer's gaze pierced my skin, but Gutman's satisfied smile made me clench my fists, holding back the urge to slam his face into the floor. So it's all a bluff? You have nothing? No. Don't start celebrating too early. We have Dr. Fairfax's statement and the supporting information he provided. We still have court orders and can prevent the destruction of any documents until we can strengthen our case. You know that members of your staff will testify for the prosecution. I can easily pin you down. Getting convictions is not a problem. He turned to me and looked at me intently. The problem is you, Mr. McCarthy. He looked at me with his prosecutor's eyes, but I saw regret and steely determination in them. I did a little research before reaching out to you. You have a good track record, and your looks really work in your favor. An ordinary man in height and appearance, a middle-aged man who's losing his hair and waistline. He was underestimated by most of his opponents, lawyers and defendants alike. He wasn't the kind of person people would tread carefully around but I walked around him carefully and did not take him for a simpleton. I used him as I needed, for my purposes, but at the same time, I made sure he could not use me. So, although he was my ally, he was now dissatisfied with me. You ruined everything, McCarthy. Why couldn't you just be a good citizen, report this firm's criminal activity, and let the law take its course? They would have ended up in prison, you would have taken revenge on your unfaithful wife and you would have walked away a rich man. Instead, he took the recorder from me and showed it to the other side of the table. The recording that was played today is a copy. All our versions are copies. McCarthy refused to provide us with the original. That means any decent defense lawyer would tear it to shreds. This means we will not be able to use it in court, and it is likely that you will be able to force Dr. Fairfax's testimony out of the case especially if he begins to have doubts and refuses to cooperate further. Not only is wiretapping illegal, but we have no way to prove that it hasn't been altered or tampered with. Moreover, we have a copy of an email he sent to a friend abroad a month ago. Mon held a piece of paper in his hand. Although no one on the other side could read it, he read aloud. Griff, I'm sorry I'm not with you in China right now. My life has become hell. I know Deer is cheating on me with her old lover. She was faking some kind of traumatic amnesia to avoid touching me and would try to annul our marriage. Most of the time, I want to kill him or at least beat her up, but sometimes I think maybe our marriage never had a chance. Maybe it was cursed from the start, and maybe it's my fault. I didn't tell anyone this, but the night I saved her from those idiots who pilled her drink, I took her to a motel and gave her some coffee. We talked, and I took her home, but what I never told her, or anyone else, was that I had to undress her to make sure she was okay, that she wasn't hurt. When she lay there on the hotel bed, still unconscious, I couldn't take my eyes off her, her breasts, her everything. I never thought I liked skinny girls, but the longer I looked at her, the more excited I became. At some point, I thought she was having a night with these guys on a regular basis, and God knows I've gotten enough women drunk over the years to get my way. Long story short, I don't think she really realized what was happening. I cleaned her up, and when she came to, I pretended nothing had happened. I don't know if she ever believed me, but the truth is I deceived her. Only it was me, not those other idiots, and everything else happened as you heard. Now we are married, and I love her, but she cheats on me, and I wonder, can a marriage that started with a lie ever end well? Maitland stared at the paper, shook his head, and then threw it on the table. Now, I don't know if this letter is true. Bailey jumped to his feet. Your victim is a liar and a rapist, and you're going to use it to destroy us? Do you realize how crazy this sounds? Not crazy, said Mond, looking between me and Deer. When he came to me, he told me his plan. He wanted to shock his wife and her lawyers, shock them enough that they would just give him his $10 million and he'd be gone. But he wasn't ready to go all the way. Therefore, he refused to hand over the original recording and provided us with this email. Normally, I would have detained him as a hostile witness and gone after you, Bailey, Wilkes, and whoever else was involved, but he played it very well. The wiretap will be torn to shreds and destroyed, but it's too deeply woven into the case. 
Even if the court does not accept it, it will still hang over the process. The news will spread, so the defense lawyers will argue that his actions were illegal, and if I don't sue, they'll go to the governor and use my opposition to attack me. Now, this is not directly related to this matter, and if I don't believe it, I shouldn't insist on it. No matter how this affects things, the girl groups will go crazy. The governor will appoint a special prosecutor, and I'll be forced to prosecute McCarthy on a charge that I know is false to cover my own fifth place. I think I'm doing a good job, and I can't do it if the whole world demands my resignation for defending abusers. He pointed to one of the secretaries, I assume she was a secretary, and asked, can someone bring me some black coffee? Black will do. Wills nodded, and the pretty blonde left the room. I don't want to send an innocent man to prison, even if I think he'll be $10 million richer when he gets out. But I don't want all of you. He gestured to the side of the table occupied by Bailey and Wills' army. To get away with fraud, theft of $10 million, perjury, incitement to perjury, bribery, filing false documents, and many other types of inventive criminal actions, he came back to me and then turned to Bailey. Just out of interest, Bailey, if McCarthy signs the papers renouncing any claim to that $10 million and agreeing to a divorce, would you seek charges of assault, lying, and other crimes, or will you let him go? These charges will disappear. He can walk away with $250,000 since Miss Lancaster has already agreed to it. Maitland stood behind Deer. You said that your husband tricked you into bed. He has a rather formal confession. Are you willing to forget about it, or once he signs the papers you want, are you going to hand over the information to women's rights groups and let them harass him? She simply shook her head, but Bailey said, she will let him go, and there will be no further charges. The last thing she wants is for all those old painful memories to come out again. At that moment, the secretary returned with a blue ceramic cup of coffee. Maitland took it and drained it in three gulps. He brought it back to Mon and walked to the front of the room, then walked to the back. It could have been for dramatic effect, but I got the feeling that he was actually walking around, thinking about the room and the people in it. I've done things in this job that I didn't want to do, which I hated because they were the right things. I know people think I'm cold and tough. People even think that I enjoy torturing others. Well, sometimes I really enjoy it, but usually, these are the people who deserve it. But in this case, Mort... You may be a real jerk, but I understand why you did it. Mort, you and Vivian don't have children, right? Married for 40 years, but no children. You were Deer's godparents, holding her in your arms when she was baptized. You probably spent as much time with her as Orion did before his death. I know you were more than just lawyer and client, and when she came to you and begged you to find a way to get her out of the marriage and then that incident happened, it gave you the perfect plan. I don't think you were thinking about money. I think you did it for her sake, and you dared her. All you're really guilty of is that you were stupid in choosing the men you love. And you, McCarthy, are guilty only of being a fool. I don't want to do this. I really don't want to. I tried my best to avoid this, but I'm simply unable to close my eyes and let someone walk away from such filth. I'll probably regret this, he said, taking out his mobile phone and dialing a number. Hello, can I speak to Mr. Edwards? Tell him it's important. Dallas, it's me. Yes, I'm afraid we'll have to take a chance. Yes, I know he's your friend, but we have evidence, and they do not want to make concessions. No, no agreement. I'd say there's an 85-90% to 90 chance of conviction, and it will be one hell of a deal, crooked lawyers, a beautiful multimillionaire, fraud, treason. This could be a movie of the week after all. He fell silent, listening to the voice on the other end of the line, then handed the phone to Bailey. He wants to talk to you for a minute. Bailey listened for two minutes. In the end, he just said, Are you serious? He returned the phone to Mond. Just give him the money, Mort. It's only $10 million. Stop it before it goes too far. Bailey leaned over to Deer and whispered in her ear. Gutman tried to say something. Shut up, idiot. It's all because of you. If you weren't so greedy, none of this would have happened. But they already threatened us, Deer said, looking first at me and then quickly turning her head away so abruptly that she could have gotten whiplash. Nothing has changed. Why do you want to give up? 
Bailey asked. Everything has changed, dear. Edwards gave Mond a free hand. He's the damn pit bull. Once he gets a hold of someone, he won't let go, and I don't want you to go through whatever happens to you when he starts. Just give McCarthy the money. Your boyfriend will get over this. She finally allowed her gaze to meet mine, without hesitation or avoidance. Okay, Michael, you won. Take your $10 million and get out of here. Let me be with the one I love, and it's not you. Bailey waved his hand at Wills, who stood up and left the room. You will receive the money tomorrow. I want it in half an hour, cashier's check, $10 million in half an hour. I think Hunt Bank can write a check for $10 million and deliver it in that time. The secretary followed Wills. Maitland sat down next to me, took out his mobile phone, and said into it, Our employees are leaving. Tell your staff that this was a highly realistic exercise we developed in collaboration with your firm to train police officers and lawyers in handling fraud cases. You showing civic consciousness agreed to play the bad guys. Dr. Fairfax, you will receive a framed certificate thanking you for your participation. All documentation will be destroyed. Dr. Teller, Mr. Wilson, you will also receive certificates for your participation. His gaze swept over Bailey's army. And Mort, I am confident that all of your staff present here today will maintain the confidentiality of this exercise. After all, I'm sure that if any distorted rumors about today's events come out, it will cause you a lot of heartache. The trust that many wealthy people place in your firm and in you is a precious commodity that you cannot afford to lose. I trust my staff, Bailey said, looking around the room, and it seemed like the temperature in the room had dropped about 30 degrees. Then we waited. People were talking in whispers. Dear and her new lover whispered, kissing from time to time. Maitland was busy with his phone. There was a knock on the door, and before anyone could react, a large policeman appeared in the doorway, leading Harper Stevens out of the room. He held his left wrist to his chest with his right hand, blood dripping from the wounds, and his face looked like a cutlet after being beaten with a hammer. Do you feel better now? asked Mond. Grove smiled a sick smile and said, You need to see the second guy. By the way, I'm going to take him to the university. How is he? Matt Henry began. I think I broke his leg, maybe his ankle. Knocked out a couple of teeth and may have a concussion. I didn't want this. I think he broke my arm, definitely broke some ribs, and I'll probably lose a couple of teeth. It's okay, he fought well. Are you guys ready for reconciliation? asked Mond. Not really, but we're okay. But I need to take him to the university, Bailey said, pointing at Matt Henry. You go with them and make sure they understand it was an accident. Take care of the paperwork and insurance. Henry simply nodded and left the room. It seemed like hours had passed, but only 35 minutes had gone by when there was a knock on the door. A secretary named Marge answered it. A large man with thick black hair streaked with gray walked in, holding a briefcase chained to his left wrist. Mr. Bailey Davidson, please convey to Miss Hunt your gratitude for her promptness and for being careful, he said. I saw a bulge under the left side of his jacket, and another man in a suit came in just behind him, also with a bulge under the right side of his jacket. The way he automatically looked around the room gave him away as a private security guard. Who should I give the check to? Should I give it directly to you? Bailey shook his head and pointed at me. Davidson sat down next to me and took out a key, which he used to open the suitcase. Inside was only one thin business envelope. He picked it up and handed it to me. If possible, open it and confirm that it is a cashier's check for $10 million. Then I will need you to fill out a form confirming that you received it. I ran my thumb along the edge of the envelope and tore it open. Inside was a sheet of paper folded in half. On the front was a cashier's check with the number one followed by seven zeros, and on the back were documents accompanying the check for $10 million. Even knowing it would appear soon, it still seemed unreal just a piece of paper. But it seemed more significant, more tangible, than paper. The stuff dreams are made of, right? I looked up at Davidson. He smiled. He appreciated the check, but it obviously wasn't a big deal to him. I had to remember that he was a big man at Hunt Bank and was accustomed to large sums. I looked at Gutman, his eyes were literally burning. At any moment, 
I expected him to burst into flames. I loved it so much that I hated ending his torment. Bailey also stared at the check and said, Okay, McCarthy, you got your money. How about we sign the papers so we can expedite the divorce? I'm in a festive mood. Could you get me a good cigar and a lighter? Oh, for God's sake, Mon, can you just get him out of here? Mort asked. I don't know, Mort. After everything today, how could it hurt if he smoked a cigar? It's a big day for everyone. Mort gestured, and one of the secretaries disappeared, reappearing a moment later with a cigar I recognized as a cheap knockoff Cuban and a cheap lighter. But I think Mort wasn't particularly friendly to me at that moment. I smoked cigars in fairly luxurious surroundings and was smoking one when I found a match while waiting for rescue in the Colombian jungle. But I did it slowly and carefully. I flicked on a lighter that looked like a cheap $1.99 one from the gas station and carefully brought the end of the cigar to the flame, drawing in the smoke and rotating it slowly. After the end of the cigar smoked, I began to blow clouds of smoke. It wasn't the best cigar I'd ever smoked, but it wasn't the worst either. It just seemed like it fit. As I smoked, the end of the cigar, or open end, for those who have never picked up this dirty but enjoyable habit, began to burn. I took the cash receipt and held it to the end of the cigar, moving it so that the flame touched the paper. Behind me, I felt David's intense, preparing to move but then stopping. It was my ten million dollars. It didn't take long before the fire began to consume the end of the check, and the flames began to slowly creep up the paper. The snow-white surface turned black with red veins. The black turned to ash and began to spread across the width of the check. No one seemed to be breathing. The rustle of the flames was the sound of many dying dreams. Someone handed me an ashtray. I held the check over it as it crumbled into black fragments, and debris fell into the glass. When it was all over, I tossed the last half inch of unburned paper into the ashtray, shook off my hands, and looked at Bailey. No one seemed to move. The expression on each face was the same, shock and disbelief. If you hand me the documents that need to be signed, I'll sign and get out of your hair. Bailey took a stack of papers and passed them across the table. They reached me without outside help. Bailey and his team carefully marked every place where my signature was required, about a hundred times. My skin tingled from the gazes running up and down my body as I signed. Finally, I finished and looked directly into Gutman's eyes. It was the strangest expression I've ever seen. Bitter, skin-corroding hatred was combined with life-affirming joy, like a child who wakes up on Christmas morning and finds a pony under the tree. I slid the papers back across the table and stood up. This day had, by far, been the longest of my life, and I had a lot to do and places to go. I was about to leave without looking at Deer, when Maitland stood up to block my path. I'm done, Mr. Mond. We're done. I need to get out of here. McCarthy, don't leave like this. That's nice, Mond. Didn't know you cared, but I have places to be. I took a risk for you. I took a huge risk. I went against my own instincts by allowing you to tie the hands of the investigation so we wouldn't get to your wife. I should have taken Bailey and Wills, but I let them go so I wouldn't crucify you. I let you get away with things that I would never let another witness get away with. I went through it all, all of it, with the thought that I'd have a rare chance to get justice for the victim. And then you're organizing this circus? He stepped back to let me pass. If I did decide to leave, done means done. I can't go after Bailey, or Wills, or anyone else anymore, and you'll leave poor and completely deceived. So can you at least tell me why you did all this? He really took a risk for me. I wanted to leave without letting Deer know the truth. I wanted to keep at least this a secret, but he deserved to know why. I took the recorder out of my pocket and played it to the next stopping point. I placed it on the table, turned the volume up to maximum, and pressed play. First, Deer's voice was heard, sleepy, purring, as it was after night. Oh, God, Julie, you're going to have to slow down a little. I don't know if my heart can take it. A little longer? Oh, I think you can handle it. Give me another 30 minutes and we'll check it out. There were unpleasant sounds. You won't get your 30 minutes if you keep doing this. Damn, you're delicious. I wish I didn't have to go back to the hotel that night. 
When does the Butter King return? Tomorrow. He should be back tomorrow, but I'm never sure. Sometimes he arrives earlier, so you have to leave today. Why do we keep doing all this nonsense, dear? Why don't you just divorce this idiot and we can live together openly? You know why. I would divorce him tomorrow, but if we do this, he will get 10 million, and you yourself don't want this. No way. I know it doesn't mean anything to you, but $10 million. He won't leave with it. Uncle Mort is working on it. He's smart. He will find a way. You're making this more difficult than it needs to be. We don't have to worry about 10 million if he's dead. No, come on. It would be so easy. He gets home, stops for gas, and a robber comes up behind him, shoots him in the back of the head, takes his wallet, and that's it. I know a dozen guys will do it for 10,000, and all our problems will disappear. No, Julian, I already told you. Don't think about it. Why? It would be so easy. No, because I'm not going to kill or let you kill Michael. He's not a bad person. It's not his fault that I don't love him or that my father included this prenuptial agreement to try to keep us together. And he loves me. Okay, okay. I was just thinking out loud. I wouldn't do anything. Don't do this. You should know there are recording devices throughout and around the house. Dad installed them. If anything, anything ever happens to Michael, an accident, or robbery, anything, I will give these tapes to the police and I'll tell them about the threats you made and how you feel about Michael. You? What, would you hand me over to the police? And would you testify against me? Me? I wouldn't want to do this. I love you and want to marry you and build a life with you. It would break my heart, but that's what I would do. I don't want you to think that I'm not serious about this. You would do it even if you went down with me? The police will be much more interested in nailing you than me, and you think they'll believe I acted alone? Would you lie about me? I cheated on my husband. I came back to you even though I promised my father on his deathbed that I would never contact you again. I killed our unborn child for you, even though it killed me. How can you do this? How can it be right to send me to prison for trying to make it possible for us to be together without secrets, but not at the cost of killing Michael? Julian, stop. It hurts. Let go. Look at me. You know the look on your face when you say his name. I see it in your eyes. Tell me the damn truth. Do you love this idiot? Julian, stop it. You're hurting me. Damn it. Tell me honestly if you love that idiot. I'll kill him myself. Send me to jail, I don't care. I'll still put a bullet in him. He may be big and strong, but a bullet hits him and he won't be strong anymore. I don't. Damn it. Stop lying. I know. I've always felt this way. I hate every minute you spend with him. I hate that he's been having an intimate with you for two years. Just tell me the truth. Julian. He's a good, decent person, and we were close for two years. A woman cannot be with such a man in his bed and not develop feelings for him. Do I love him? Maybe. I definitely have feelings for him. There's nothing I can do about it, but I don't love him the way I love you. You were my first, and you will be my last. You have to believe in that. Make me believe it. Oh, I think I can do this. I pressed the stop button. I didn't take my eyes off the recorder because I didn't want to see Deer's expression. You're still in love with me? Her voice made me look into her face, and I saw something I didn't want to see, pity. I'm sorry, Michael. I'm not in love with you, dear. I stopped loving you the moment I heard you making love to him. But you were willing to risk prison for me. Honestly, I couldn't send you to jail after that. I looked at Wilson and Teller and said, Thank you, gentlemen, for your help in this matter. Then I extended my hand to Mond. He shook it. Thank you for everything, Mr. Mond. Hope this answers your questions. Yes. Where are you heading now? Away from here. I doubt we'll meet again. Good luck. I reached the door. Dear, don't try to contact me ever, for no reason. 
if you die before me, don't ask your people to tell me about it. I won't come, because from today, you're dead to me. I walked out the door and left the continental US within three hours. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, it was only thanks to a private detective that our protagonist managed to find out about his wife's infidelity. What's your impression? Write in the comments. Until new videos.